Hi, I'm John Travolta. Over the next hour, you'll be watching a miracle of engineering, a real milestone in aviation happening right before your eyes, the building of the biggest airliner the world has ever seen, the Airbus A380. Since I was a kid, I've been crazy about flying. I've always wanted to sit right here in the captain's seat. And after getting my 707 and 747 pilot's license for Qantas, I can do that now. And believe me, I fly whenever I can. It's one of my greatest pleasures. For me, all airplanes are fascinating machines. So being in on the birth of one of the most amazing planes ever conceived is a real dream come true. Get ready for a hair-raising story of ocean-going ships, 96-wheeled trucks, and a flying monster called the Beluga. The latest technology at the mercy of the winds, the tides, and a tape measure. Are you ready for takeoff? Then here we go. Imagine an airplane that holds almost 600 people. Imagine an airplane with space for showers, stores, and bars. Imagine an airplane that could change air travel forever. Get ready, because that dream is about to come true. This is the inside story of a multi-billion dollar gamble, a game of high stakes, high technology, big machines, gigantic buildings, the creation of a new breed of airplane, bigger, more powerful, more luxurious than anything you've ever seen. A battle for the skies. The Paris Air Show, France, June 2003. For people who build airplanes, it's the most important event of the year. Far away from the sweating crowds and the spinning stunt planes, one man walks through the VIP area. His name is Charles Champion. On his shoulders rests the fate of the company known as Airbus. What is at stake, I would say, with such a program is basically the future of, uh, of the company as such. Really? Really. Just two companies produce almost all of the world's large airliners. One is Airbus, and the other is Boeing. The two have been locked in a deadly battle for years. Now Airbus want to overshadow Boeing's entire product range and build a machine that will make the legendary 747, the jumbo jet, obsolete. This is John Leahy. He's got the tough job of selling 250 planes at $265 million each. And that's just to break even. Pressure? Of course there's pressure when you're spending $10.7 billion. Of course there's pressure. When you're designing an aircraft that's bigger than any that was ever produced in the history of mankind, of course there's pressure. They've set a tough schedule just 20 months till the first takeoff of the biggest airliner in history. A year and a half of pressure, stress, and sleepless nights. We are crazy. Witness the first installment of this incredible challenge. The race to build the enormous parts for the new machine, carry them thousands of miles across oceans, along rivers, over land, to where they'll finally be assembled. There's just 87 weeks till the big bird flies. Steve Chadwick. Brought Great Britain, November 2003. It's 6.30 in the morning. Inside this brand new factory, Simon Shingler and his team are about to venture into the unknown. I don't want anyone to get complacent. We need to make sure we're concentrating on what we're doing. Or else there will be a likelihood we'll bend something or hurt someone. 
we can't afford for that. Here, over the last five months, more than 350 engineers have been working day and night, constructing the world's largest airliner wing. One hundred and nineteen feet long, it's been painstakingly built up lying on its back edge. It looks more like a ship than part of a plane. High capacity, radio controlled cranes are used to maneuver the components into position. Today is the day they lift the complete wing free of its supporting framework and get the chance to see the entire enormous structure for the first time. What's going on in front of you? The whole idea of having you all here is to make sure that you're all concentrating on your one specific station. Right? And that's how we're going to ensure that we're going to take this wing out without anyone hurting themselves or without the components getting damaged. The wing, although longer and heavier than two 18-wheelers parked end to end, is made to a tolerance of less than half a millimeter. To damage it now would be a disaster. Everybody gets very excited and it's easy to, uh, to sort of leave one of the attachments in place or part of the tooling, but there's so many attachments around the periphery of the wing. If that happens, then it's, uh, it causes damage when it's being lifted. Mark Burroughs has been on the project for eight years. Today, he gets to see the fruit of his labor. Well, it's a big achievement, really, after a, you know such a long time of development, conceptual development, bringing everything together. Uh, it's a big occasion for everybody. Yeah. But raising 30 tons of aluminum and carbon fiber is not a task to be taken lightly. All the mobile phones are turned off. <laughs> 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 the nerve center of the company is in Toulouse, a small city in southwestern France. From here, Charles Champion controls nearly $11 billion worth of high-tech investment. If he fails to deliver the plane on time, it could be the end of Airbus. The buck stops with him. Airbus is riding on this, yes, definitely. Building such an aircraft, it's a bit like climbing a mountain. Yeah? You see the mountain in the distance. It looks you know, high, but not too high. And you start walking, and you've got the first, uh, first level. And then you say, whoo, this one was hard. And you've got the next one. It's even harder. And, and so you, you see the summit. It's getting closer. But at the end of the day, there's still a lot to walk and uh, a lot to climb. You can't just build the world's biggest airliner. You've got to sell it. To do that, Airbus has built the mother of all showrooms. This purpose-built complex is filled with full-size demonstrators of each of its planes. And in pride of place is the A380. John Leahy's worked for Airbus for 20 years. Now's his biggest challenge, to convince the airlines they should be spending a lot of money on a plane that has yet to fly. Why would you want to spend $265 million for something like this? Because it'll do something no other airplane in the world can do. And that's bring people 8,000 nautical miles and a level of comfort that's never been provided before. Though this interior looks cool, it's still just a fantasy, a suggestion of what could be done with a plane this big. How often do you see this? Well, yes, it's an extra large loo, but it's also a shower. And this is something that you don't see in an airplane, and maybe you should. The A380 will be the first plane to have two full-length passenger decks, a unique selling point. And the innovations don't stop there. How about a duty-free store, a staircase with integrated waterfall, leading up to a spacious lounge area complete with bar? We've done it before. We've been there. We know how to deliver. And we will this time as well. To build big planes, 
First, you need big buildings. And since the year 2001, vast new factories have been springing up all over Europe. The British Wing Factory took two years to build. The foundations go down 105 feet to support the massive assembly machinery. But Britain contains only a part of the operation. 500 miles to the east, over in Germany, just outside Hamburg, another massive facility has been built on land reclaimed from the nearby river Elbe. Here's where most of the huge fuselage will be assembled, stitched together from parts made all over the world. There are also factories near Paris, in Western France, and in South and Central Spain. All are gearing up to produce parts for the new giant. It's a truly global effort with tens of thousands of people involved. It's big, it's really big. You name it and the people are working on it. So at the end of the day, it's almost impossible to count the number of people working on this project. But the new factory in Toulouse is the daddy of them all. The final assembly line is where the various components of the plane will be joined together to create the finished airplane. Work began in 2001 on a complex that would cost $436 million on its own. There's enough steel here to build the Eiffel Tower four times over. The factory is split into bays the roofs hoisted into place complete with lighting and fire control systems already installed. A third of a mile long, 270 yards wide, it covers 24 acres, big enough to hold eight planes at once. Ultimately, it will produce one new A380 every single week of the year. An exciting, perhaps daunting prospect for the man who has to sell them. Everything's scaled up. If the airplane's big, the tools must be big. The building must be big. And just think, you look around here, you're looking at a construction site now, you look at those massive cranes up there that can move big fuselage sections around. But in a few months, when we're back here, you'll see an airplane coming together. What we have to do now, after the orders have been taken, the contract's done, the money's been put down, we have to make sure that we deliver on what we promise. And that means we have to have not just world-class engineering, but world-class manufacturing as well. Back in Britain, that manufacturing process is well underway. They've reached a critical stage in removing the wing from its frame. Alan Ferguson is in charge of attaching two cranes to the solid titanium lifting points on the 30-ton wing. We're making sure we get the crane correctly aligned with the lifting attachment so as when we make the initial lift, we don't get any sway on the wing. So it's, it's critical, yeah. Both cranes properly aligned, the lift itself can now go ahead. They've rehearsed the operation many times, but only in a computer. Within half an hour, they'll find out if their simulations have been correct. A multi-million dollar wing depends on it. As you can see, building any aircraft is a tough business. Stay tuned to TLC, it gets tougher. As the biggest civil aviation project in history gathers momentum, Alan Ferguson and Simon Shingler face a huge challenge. They're about to lift a 30-ton wing out of its assembly jig and lay it flat for the first time. Three hours into the operation, they're at a critical point. 
mistakes at this stage can cause a lot of damage and uh, because of the sheer size and weight of everything we need to make sure we've got everything covered safety wise. First, they need to free the fuselage end of the wing using compressed air to retract the huge steel clamp that holds it in place. But there's a problem. No matter how many times they try, the clamp won't release fully. After several checks, they work out what's wrong. A forgotten bolt is in the way. It's a frustrating glitch for Alan. The clamp is off, but it's a delay that Alan could do without. At last, we can see the true scale of the wing. The final job is to make sure that all the attachment points have been released. Forgetting one now would be a disaster. If we did forget something, then it would, uh, uh, the component which was still attached would get deformed, damaged. Right, we're ready to go. We want everyone in place now, yeah. and then we, it's like we're going for it now, completely. All right, gather round, please, gents. The operations team and the crane driver is going to take some weight, we're going to release the front spar, and then we're going to remove the wing. Try to stay calm, don't panic. We'll do everything nice and slowly, there's no rush now. But we, once we start, we're not stopping. Thanks very much. All right, you're clear, take it off. Get that spar support out, please, is it down? Right. Yeah. With one small movement, the wing is free. Now it can be lifted clear of the main jig and into the next hall. Don't forget the outboard end. For the team, it's a dramatic climax to three years of hard work. I'm feeling elated. <laughs> Might not look it, but inside I'm quite excited. Well done, Jim. The wing may look big now, but once the moving parts are fitted, it will grow by half as much again. And it's only one of a pair. The true size of the finished airliner is starting to show. We've got something here to be very proud of that we hope will keep us in work for a long time in the future. I think the whole world's going to uh, look on in awe the day it flies. I think the Boeing Aircraft Company have got something to uh, be very wary of. But even as the wing is lowered into horizontal position for its final assembly, the finer points of the A380's design are still far from finalized. The schedule is so tight, there's no time to build one or two aircraft, test fly them, make adjustments and then carry on. Modern computer design and simulation techniques mean that everything is happening at once. In Hamburg, in the massive new hangar built to assemble the sections of the fuselage, work has already started on the parts for the first six aircraft. Even though it will be over a year before the first A380 is in one piece, let alone racing down a runway.
The fuselage is built up from aluminum panels stitched together with thousands and thousands of rivets, fitted mostly by hand. Parts come from all over the world. Floor beams made from ultralight carbon fiber are from Japan. The entire tail section is also carbon fiber, made in a state-of-the-art facility in Spain. Everyone at Airbus is feeling the heat, especially those at the very top. With a project lasting years, everyone must find their own way to deal with the inevitable stress. This is a marathon endeavor, and overall chief Charles Champion clears his head by running whenever he can. It's a question of time management, because uh, not only time management within at, at, at work, but also uh, time management with your personal life. And you can burn out, huh? basically, yeah, if you're not careful, you just can burn out, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, you're, you're, you're out. Can we start? The pressure comes to a peak every two weeks, when the heads of each department gather from all over Europe to report on their progress. It's a tough environment that has seen firings and resignations. Andreas Fering has recently been brought in to replace the previous head of interior engineering. It's particularly tough because he's inherited a department that's three months behind schedule and over budget. Team and myself, we are under enormous pressure. People are exhausted already. And uh, sometimes they are a little bit, uh, let's say, overstressed, and the reaction is overstressed as well. Because um, if you then have a, a very, very quick requirement coming in, you have to do this, you have to, to speed up, and so on. They do not understand because they are working like hell already. This discreet, unmarked warehouse is where the brand new cabin will be born. Here, in private, is where Airbus and the airlines can agree exactly on how the inside will look. Now let's enter inside what we are doing over here. Having the, the workload is massive. Each airline wants a customized interior, so Andreas has to engineer dozens of unique features to keep them all happy. When you have discussion with the customers, you don't show him a mock-up of the wing or a mock-up of the, of the vertical stabilizer or something like this. You show to him a mock-up of the cabin, giving him the impression how it could look like for his customers, the area where he is earning the money. You can change the lighting area over here. You can have green light, you can have blue light. Andreas has the difficult task of turning the airline's high expectations of showers and the like into reality. We will have showers on our aircraft, but not in a way like they are displayed at the moment in Toulouse, because these are sorts of designers, not of engineers uh, building the stuff. Here at the, moment we have the overhead bins have to carry a load of 110 pounds. They're a major headache for Andreas. The loading limitation of these bins are 50 kilos or 60 kilos. So you can imagine that if you have a stewardess or a passenger trying to move 50 kilo like this, is not, they are not that strong uh, and it is a, a difficulty. Nearby is Airbus's top secret research facility, where technicians strive to find solutions to these problems. They've come up with a prototype electric bin, but nothing is ever straightforward. For closing, you push again, and the thing is closing. It's a very simple item, but uh, if you go now to the rear of this uh, feature, you can see uh, that the device which is used over here uh, with all these uh, specific belts and mechanical devices or electromechanical devices is something which will be very difficult to integrate. 
and of course it's a very uh, weight pen penalizing uh, equipment. The bins are just one of hundreds of items that Andreas may soon have to make real. You will smile, I'm sure. Have you ever seen it before? No. <laughs> Come in. Head of cabin development, Herman Schott, is showing off a bar that fits into the cargo area. <laughs> wow. Is this for an aircraft or is this for an um, undersea boat? <laughs> I'm sure if you show this to a customer, he will buy it immediately. But we need to be sure that what we show to our customers is really something which we can manufacture as well. Oh. What is really needed is time. Time, time, time. With the first set of wings nearing completion in Britain, and the fuselage parts almost ready to leave Germany, time is the one thing Andreas Fering does not have. Makes you realize what goes into a modern airliner, huh? Bet you won't take your plane for granted next time you step aboard. We'll be back soon. The design of the new Airbus A380 goes back a long way. Philip Jarry was one of the elite team involved from the very beginning. I think it was in 88, where there were the first meetings, very secret meetings, between very few people in Airbus, who said, well, if we had to imagine a very big airplane, let's say 500 or 600 seats, how would it look? If you pretend to offer to the uh, airline, the major airline of the world, a top class, top efficient airplane, you cannot compromise, as simple as this. So he, it has to be a fully new design. Soon there were hundreds, then thousands of engineers, technicians, computer specialists, and aerodynamics experts toiling round the clock to create a plane like no other. The new machine would have two full width decks, with 49% more floor space than the Jumbo. The airlines told us, don't be shy, don't hesitate. Of course it has to be big. It has to be bigger than anything that is flying. So don't be shy, don't hesitate. Make it really big. But there was one more factor the team had to contend with. A monster that's long cast its shadow over the entire operation. This is the Beluga, the extraordinary, some would say freakish cargo plane, custom built by Airbus. There are planes that can carry more weight, but the Beluga has everything else in the world beat when it comes to volume. This machine can swallow a load 16 foot wide by 16 foot tall by 70 feet long in one gulp. The Beluga is vital to the way that Airbus works. It's used to carry components from factories all over Europe to the final assembly lines in France and Germany. On average, this industrial powerhouse produces almost one airliner every day. It's a complex system that ensures one weird fact. An Airbus jet has already flown thousands of miles before it's ever taken off. But when it comes to the A380, there's one huge problem. None of the supersized parts would fit inside the Beluga. In fact, the Beluga could uh, fit inside the A3XX. So we had to think of something completely different. The team devised a system that uses roads, rivers, and the sea in a logistical dance that has to fit together perfectly and work first time. The fuselage, wings, and tailplanes will set off by sea from Hamburg, Wales, France, and Spain, converging on the port of Poyac on the west coast of France. From there, they are loaded onto barges that will carry them 59 miles up the river Garonne. And still, the journey is not complete. 
A fleet of trucks will haul the parts by road the last 152 miles to Toulouse. Airbus have commissioned a custom-built ship from China to carry the parts, but it won't be ready for the first transports. Instead, they've hired a general-purpose cargo vessel to ship the first fuselage components from Hamburg. But even that is having problems. They've discovered a three-foot crack in the rudder and must repair it before the 30 tons of airplane can get underway. The repairs stretch long into the night. As ever, the clock is ticking. Hi, I'm John Travolta. You're watching the world's biggest airliner, the A380 on TLC. Don't go away. Hamburg, Germany, early morning, and the first finished fuselage sections of the biggest airliner the world has ever seen emerge into the light of day. The parts are carried on purpose-built, radio-controlled, self-powered low loaders. Each one has 96 wheels and can travel at a maximum speed of only six miles per hour. The factory is just a few hundred yards from the purpose-built dock where the cargo ship waits. Engineers finally finished welding the rudder at three o'clock the previous morning. And now is the time for these outsized parts to start their 970 mile journey by sea. They're gonna have to make good speed if they're to recover the time lost to the delay. In Britain, another early start, as another massive plant is about to release the components built within its cavernous interior. Gareth Williams is in charge of the operation. For him, today is a big day. After the last two months of preparation, and the previous two years of planning, we've actually got the moment now when the wing's going. So it's an exciting time, and it's what people here have looked for for many, many months. Stage one of this thousand mile trip is to get the wing from the factory to the nearby River Dee, where the giant piece will be loaded onto a barge. Again, a low loader is used, but this one is modified. The truck has to pass over a narrow railroad bridge. And to prevent a collision, a special guide wire has been built into the road to ensure the truck doesn't hit the bridge. As the truck approaches, they are depending on the system to work. If all goes to plan, the clearance will be a matter of inches. The high-tech system works, and the next phase is to load the wing onto the barge. Now the dangerous tides on this treacherous stretch of river are their biggest headache. It's, uh, it's not to be messed with, this river. The tide's important because downstream, there are three low bridges, and beyond them lie constantly shifting sandbanks. Sail when the tide is too high, and the barge will hit the bridge. Wait for it to fall, and they could easily run aground. It's a real balancing act as to where you get off the, off the blocks and get under the bridge. Graham Harwood, the barge captain, has been studying the river for the last four months. He's planning on clearing the first and lowest bridge by just 19 inches. We've got to have half a meter clearance under the bridges, so the timing is of the essence like now. Neither is this the best time of the month, with the current running particularly fast. They haven't picked the right time for us because the tide is making probably about five knots. And, um, you know, we've got to compete with that later on. So not, not the best time of year, not the best tide for the first time it's been done. But I'm sure we'll manage it. We'll have to. At last, the wing is gently maneuvered onto the barge and the low loader carefully retracted. It's time to put all the theory into practice.
the crew are constantly monitoring the clearance under the bridge. But as they approach, they realize the strong wind is holding the tide back. They might hit the bridge too soon. So Graham holds off for a few more seconds. Yeah, there it is. Boop, boop. I thought it was ringing any taller than they say it is. <laughs> Exactly 50 centimeters. Exactly. 19 inches exactly. Graham has judged it perfectly. Cutting it so fine under the bridges means he has plenty of water under his keel for the remaining 13 miles of river. Now he can rely on his extensive knowledge of the river's channels and navigate to the next way station on the wing's incredible journey. Ahead lies another ship, a long voyage across the open Atlantic Ocean, and eventually the vast assembly hall in France. There's a long way to go. You know, I've been fascinated by flying since I was a kid. It's kind of what pushed me forward through life. And I'm sure that this new Airbus will inspire a whole new generation of kids to go for their dreams too. We'll be back soon. Here in Toulouse, in southwestern France, is the final assembly hall. It's empty now, but not for long. In a few days, the construction of the biggest airliner in the world will begin, the Airbus A380. But before that, the components still have a long way to go. The fuselage sections from Germany have been at sea for three days, and are now approaching the west coast of France. The wings have been loaded onto a ship in Britain. Now they're well into the Atlantic Ocean. All these massive parts are heading for the port of Poyac, where the next phase will begin. First to arrive is the fuselage. Here the ship's Russian captain, feeling protective of his cargo, gets angry with the French dock workers for not being careful enough. What is this? This is very important job. Using yet more low loaders, the parts are soon transferred onto barges and begin a 59 mile journey up the mighty river Garonne. The trip takes in the ancient city of Bordeaux and its historic bridge, the 180-year-old Pont de Pierre. Here again, the clearance is minimal, only a couple of feet on either side. Barge captain Elie Blanchy has never carried anything like this before. It all goes to plan, and he clears the bridge easily helped by state-of-the-art technology that allows the barge to partially sink itself into the water. Meanwhile, the wings have arrived at the dockside, and they too are loaded onto a barge and begin their journey up the river. The last stage of this incredible journey is by road, 152 miles to the final assembly line in Toulouse. The three pieces of fuselage are gathered in a gigantic convoy, each hauled by a 600 horsepower truck. To minimize the disturbance, they travel at night, winding their way through the French countryside on roads that have been closed off by the police. At this speed, the trip will take three nights, and now is the last and most difficult part of the journey. 
Halfway along the final stretch lies the small village of Levignac. This is the narrowest point on the entire journey. The fuselage will pass within inches of people's homes. It's an event that's attracted massive public interest, and the police are taking crowd control very seriously. Daniel Boutonnet is the man who has to keep this huge show on the road. I'm, co I'm confident, I'm uh, not anxious, uh, uh, but uh, for me, uh, I would prefer to be uh, three hours in, in the future. It's time to find out if the measurements have been correct. Traveling by car ahead of the first truck, Daniel needs to keep the drivers warned of any hazards. His main problem is the hundreds of people that have turned out to watch the massive parts go by. You know, my, I'm a little bit uh, afraid by the number of people and has the, the road uh, in the street. It's very narrow. We can't have uh, uh, some accident with people. It's uh, what could be uh, very dangerous. Eh? As they enter Levignac, the police are nervous and progress is painfully slow. Now the moment of truth. Will the 24 foot wide fuselage fit through the gap? This is the narrowest espace for the streets for all crossing Bevignac. Yes, it's really in here, in this place where we are. They've done it. The gap is just 20 inches either side. All three components make it through without a hitch. We are crazy. While some applaud the convoy, others are not so happy at the disruption. We used to be a quiet little village. Now look. When the plane hits full production, this will happen once every week. With Levignac successfully navigated, the last 11 miles are relatively easy. At last, after traveling by ship, barge, and truck, the lights of the final assembly line are in sight. Although it's nearly three o'clock in the morning, there are several hundred people waiting outside the massive new factory. Among them, Charles Champion, ready to share in this moment of triumph. The delivery papers are signed, and once the wings arrive in a few days' time, Charles and his team will be ready to assemble the future of aviation, the biggest airliner in history, the Airbus A380. For some people, it's like a relief because they've, they've delivered the final assembly line, they've done the factory, they've demonstrated the transport system. But for us guys, we are looking the next steps, integration, first flight, then flight test phase, and then delivers to the customers. Although they've come a long way, there's still a very long way to go.